Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Disease Modeling and Cancer Therapy and Stem Cell-Derived 3D Organoid Systems. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Devangeli Dutta, postdoctoral researcher, Hubrecht Institute, Hans Cleaver Lab. Dr. Dutta is currently pursuing her postdoctoral research in the lab of Professor Hans Cleaver's Netherlands, where she's using human tissue-derived 3D organoid cultures to study host microbiome interactions, infectious diseases, and cancer. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Dutta, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you all for joining me for this webinar. Um, I'm a postdoc in Hans Clever's group, and today I'll be talking about uh, how the 3D organoid system can be used for disease modeling as well as cancer therapy. So what exactly are organoids? So, uh, I mean, very broadly speaking, organoids are 3D stem cell tissue-derived structures, or as we call them, uh, the mini organs in a dish. These mimic the in vivo architecture of tissues uh, structurally, functionally, as well as genetically. Uh, and because of these features, the organoids provide really powerful means for ex vivo modeling as an in vitro model system for stem cell research and also in developmental biology. Uh, stem cell uh, organoids can be developed from two different kinds of stem cells. And very broadly, again, uh, they can be either pluripotent stem cell-derived organoids, uh, which are basically embryonal stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cell-derived uh, organoids, and the adult stem cell-derived organoids. And I'll be talking about these a bit more in detail in the coming slides. Uh, but just to give you an overview of how many kinds of organoids have been developed already, and here you see a panel of organoids so from the adult stem cells. Uh, we have isolated and developed uh, intestinal organoids, liver organoids, uh, ovarian organoids, lung organoids, uh, whereas from the pluripotent uh, stem cells, um, again, liver, stomach, uh, uh, even uh, kidney organoids have been developed. Brain organoids have been uh, developed, which have been used recently for Zika virus uh, infection studies, and also other sensory organoids. So what exactly uh, or how are these pluripotent stem cell-derived organoids developed? So this is a schematic showing how they are actually generated. So the pluripotent stem cells are first grown in lab as embryoid bodies or the spheroids. And these are uh, pluripotent in nature. Basically, they are derived from master cells, as we call them, because these can actually differentiate into and form any kind of uh, cell type. That is, in theory, the uh, idea of behind a pluripotent stem cell. So when these are grown as embryoid bodies or spheroids in uh, the tissue culture, depending on what kind of signals are provided to them, like differentiation signals, they can be uh, differentiated into different kinds of tissue. And these, when they are embedded with the matrigel in 3D, these then form the specialized organoids. Whereas the adult stem cell organoids uh, are somewhat more defined because they are already isolated from the tissue of origin. For example, uh, in this case, uh, what, I'm, what I'm showing you is like a, an intestinal biopsy. And what we do is we get a biopsy, we mince the tissue into small pieces, and then I, ideally, I either isolate the crypts from the intestine or we kind of make them into single cells, which are then plated uh, in 3D in matrigel, which is an extracellular matrix. And within two to three days, we already see these organoids growing. 
And most of the work that I show today is based on the adult stem cell derived organoids because these are the organoids that we use in our lab, in the Clivers lab, for all the studies. So uh, what uh, are these organoids exactly? So these organoids that I'm talking about, the adult tissue derived organoids, are mostly epithelial in origin. They do not have any mesenchymal niche, per se. And uh, they are grown in an extracellular matrix, which provides them with a lot of factors to help them grow. Uh, this can be either mat matrigel, uh, the basement membrane extract, or recently we have also used a synthetic hydrogel, which is essentially polyethylene glycol. And this is uh, important because uh, both matrigel and BME are not very much defined because they are isolated from the sarcoma cells of the mouth. Whereas if there is a synthetic hydrogel which is more defined in uh, characteristics, then the studies are also way more defined. And one more important aspect uh, of these uh, organoids are that they can be kept in culture for extended periods of time, or sometimes, or most of them actually have been grown for more than a year in culture, and they maintain all their genetic structure uh, or genetic uh, basis, as well as the structure and all the functions. And here is a picture which uh, basically shows you how from a single cell at day zero, the cell then divides, forms these small organoids, and by day 13, it forms the fully, uh, full, uh, full organoid is formed with a basolateral as well as epical polarity. So it is important also to know that organoids um, have polarity. Mostly the interior or the lumen side of the organoids are uh, epical in nature, whereas the outside is more basolateral in nature. Um, so next we will see a video uh, which basically will give you an idea of how these organoids are grown. These organoids, uh, as I showed, are start, they basically start as single cells and in culture they grow into these big organoids and then they need to be sheared using trypsin and then again plated with matrigel so that they grow and can be expand, expanded for long periods. What you saw just now is how the organoids are grown and expanded in culture, right? So uh, what is also, again, important to know is that the organoids are really like a mini organ. So when they are grown in expansion media, these are the EM, we call them as EM. So these essentially have a stem cell-like characteristics, and that is why they expand in culture. That's how you see when you trypsinize them, and then you again play them, and they keep growing. And if you want to really differentiate them into a certain cell type, then you have to put them in differentiation media. This is by either withdrawing some factors, like for example in the case of intestinal stem cell organoids, you have to withdraw the wind so that they kind of become more differentiated in characteristic and so on for different organoid cultures. So we call them as expansion media uh, and differentiation media, two different kinds of media. And here what I'm showing you is uh, when you put these organoids in differentiation media, they kind of form uh, different cell types. Here in marked and alkaline phosphatase are the enterocytes, uh, mucin producing goblet cells, and so on. So uh, the organoid technology, there are lots of applications of organoid technology. Uh, as first uh, application is biobanking of patient-derived organoids. So biobanking is basically like a bank. So you can go there and you have like a panel of organoids derived from patient material of different individuals and these can be used for drug testing or for disease modeling. Uh, we have also used uh, tumor and cystic fibrosis organoids to test different drugs. And also we can do host microbe interaction studies using these organoids. And I'll be talking um, mostly about disease modeling of cancer 
along with uh, a little bit of host microbe interaction studies and how also biobanking of patient-derived organoids is being done and how all of these together can be brought into a co-culture system. So uh, how does the organoid system help in personalized therapy or personalized cancer treatment? Uh, the first uh, benefit of having organoids is that most of the cell lines that have been used till date are cancerous, but we do not really have a baseline or a healthy tissue. Uh, what for organoids, what we do is when we get a patient material, we isolate the tissue from the healthy part of the uh, tissue as well as the cancerous part. And as a result, we have organoids of the same patient from the cancerous tissue as well as the healthy tissue. So these organoids are all genetically characterized, so we basically can go back and correlate which kind of mutations are present and how these organoids are responding to drug therapy. And as I said, they can be cryopreserved and also expanded and kept in culture for extended periods of time. They can be used again and again for various disease and disease testing and drug testing. Uh, how do these help actually in drug, uh, is, I, I, I mean, um, sorry, figuring out what kind of drug is actually good for a certain patient? So here in this picture, you see, for example, we have three drugs, drug A, drug B, and drug T, C. Out of this, when we test say, does all these drugs on the patient organoids as well as the cancer organoids, drug A kills both the healthy as well as the cancerous organoid. However, drug B and C uh, selectively kill the cancer organoid, which be, uh, shows us kind of that this is a good target or these two drugs can potentially be drugs which can be used for therapy. and. But one thing that obviously uh, we all know is that the drugs which mostly fail the clinical trial phase is because they cause liver toxicity. And so we again bring in the liver organoids at this stage, and if we test these drugs, for example, from our first screen, we know drug B and drug C were good or potential drugs for this patient, and then we check for liver toxicity, and here we see that while drug B doesn't cause any liver toxicity, drug C does. And so we come to the conclusion that for this specific patient, drug B is probably the best combination or the best drug uh, that can be provided. So the liver bio, uh, living biobanks of cancer organoids have been developed. Uh, uh, the first living biobank that was developed in our lab was the colorectal cancer biobank. And recently, we have also developed a breast cancer uh, organoid biobank. And this was uh, developed from uh, 150 uh, patient samples. And this list shows um, all the different uh, types of cancers which have been uh, created as biobanks and which can be uh, obtained, and also different tests can be performed on these. Recently in our lab, we have also uh, developed a new system, which is the lung organoid system, and we call them as the human airway organoids, and these can be used for both cancer as well as cystic fibrosis modeling. These uh, carry all the cell types, the basal cells, the club cells, and the ciliated cells. And we are also in the process of developing a cancer lung, lung cancer biobank, which will also be available for testing different kinds of drugs in the future. Uh, so till now, I've been talking about how we isolate the cancer, uh, cancerous tissue and then develop them into organoids. But we can also do it the other way around. Basically, we can model cancer using healthy organoids, but making mutations in them. So this was uh, in a paper published in 2015 where we used CRISPR-Cas9 to induce mutations in the healthy organoids, and we could follow these different, different mutations. So basically, a single mutation was first created, and then these mutated organoids were selected, then a second mutation was added, and so on. And it was found that while a single mutated, uh, single gene mutated organoid did not really uh, lead to metastasis, whereas a quadruple mutant, which had four mutations, did lead to uh, metastasis and was uh, much more uh, like uh, malignant in nature. And so this is another aspect of cancer modeling which can be uh, used or useful in lab for uh, cancer modeling. But when we talk about like the human body, as I said, these organoids are mostly epithelial in nature. We uh, should not forget that our body actually has the gut, 
uh, that is the epithelial cells, the microbes, and also the immune cells. So if we really want to uh, recapitulate the in vivo environment, we add, need to add immune cells as well as the microbes into this. And so uh, the idea is to have a triple co-culture system. And uh, the recent uh, branch of cancer therapy, which is much, uh, very much in news today, is cancer immunotherapy. And the 2018 Nobel Prize went to Dr. Alson and Dr. Chokosu for their work on immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is essentially uh, modeling or kind of inducing your own immune cells to target the cancer tissue. And we think that with a triple co-culture system of uh, organoids, immune cells, as well as the microbiome, we might be able to help this field uh, of immunotherapy. And how we will we plan to do that is what I'll explain now. So this is a model of how we think the triple co-culture system should look like. So first, with the organoids, we plan to add the immune cells isolated from the same donor. So basically, the immune cells from the same patient from whom we have isolated the organoid uh, tissue for the organoids and then add the bacteria or the commensal bacteria into the organoid lumen so as to have all three components together. And, and this uh, idea was uh, tested recently uh, in collaboration with another lab where uh, it was shown that the tumor reactive T cells, when they are cultured with tumor cells and healthy cells, the T uh, cells which were uh, when they are cultured together, basically they react with the tumor organoids and they lead to the death of the tumor organoids. However, they do not cause any death in the healthy organoids. And this is a picture showing the same. On the left, you see healthy organoids which were exposed to autologous T cells. And this is in the presence of a green fluorescent caspase probe. So essentially, all the cells, if, they are, if there is cell death, uh, it will light up as green. And on the left is, are the control cells, along with the immune cells, there was no cell death, whereas when there are tumor organoids and the T cells are added, uh, a green fluorescent signal was observed, basically showing that this co-culture of immune cell with the tumor organoids is very much uh, efficient in uh, recapitulating the, uh, the in vivo uh, architecture and also the in vivo functioning. Uh, now, at the same time, what we were also developing is how and how can we get the microbes into the organoids? Uh, because the microbes, as I said, are present on the epical side, and for us, the intestinal organoids, mostly the epical side, is on the interior part. And so we have developed this new technique, which is uh, basically microinjection of the uh, microbes into the organoid lumen. And here you see an organoid which is uh, injected with microbes. And we add a green dye so that we can visualize and see which organoids have been uh, injected or not. And below is an example of a fluorescently labeled bacteria injected into the organoid lumen. And as you see, this is visible not only three hours later, but also for extended periods of time. So uh, when we wanted to check like, if our, uh, uh, our co-culture of bacteria and uh, organoids is actually functional or not, what we did was we first tested a pathogenic bacteria and we injected Shigella, which is a pathogenic bacteria known to induce cell death in, um, in, in vivo. And what you see here is when we injected the control organoids with, uh, with normal PBS, there was no effect. However, when we injected them with the pathogenic bacteria, there was a massive cell death and a complete disruption of the organoid architecture. This was a proof of concept that indeed uh, a co-culture of organoids with the microbes would work. We extended our study and uh, of course it was important for us to also uh, somehow let the anaerobic bacteria also survive in the organoid lumen and for that we have now set up conditions by which we can grow these anaerobic bacteria inside the organoid lumen for extended periods of time and here you see colony forming assays for different bacteria and the fact that they actually grow both in expansion and differentiation media, they are able to survive in the organoid lume. Um, as a, again a proof of concept, what we did was we uh, added the immune cells and here in the picture you see on the left a control organoid without any virus and surrounded by uh, uh, the surrounding the organoids are the immune cells 
whereas uh, on the infected panels, you see uh, in green the virus which was added to the uh, organoid, and as soon as the virus is added, you see a massive influx of the immune cells towards the infected uh, organoid. And so this was a proof of concept of like a first triple co-culture model where we brought in the epithelial organoids, a microbe, and the immune cells. And now, right now, what we are developing in lab is the co-culture, as I said, of the tumor organoids, blood lymphocytes, and the commensal microbes. Um, so I'll quickly summarize uh, what I told you today. So organoids or mini organs in a dish can be developed from pluripotent stem cells or adult stem cells. Uh, organoids have been established from multiple organs, which include the intestine, the kidney, the brain, liver, stomach, pancreas, ovaries, and the lung. Organoids can be used for multiple clinical applications, including disease modeling, uh, for drug screening, for various host microbe interaction studies, and for regenerative therapy. Uh, we can also manipulate genes or perform gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, as I showed, like we can sequentially mutate uh, different genes, and this will, again, enable disease modeling and targeted gene therapy. Uh, we have now been able to show that a co-culture of tumor organoids along with T cells uh, leads to tumor reactive T cells. Uh, also, uh, co-cultures of microbes with the organoids have shown that there is a complex interplay between the microbes and the epithelium uh, and uh, we, are, we can do this for not just like one tissue, but for brain, stomach, and intestine, and various different tissues. And uh, finally, I think uh, what is very important is development of a triple co-culture system, which will help us uh, figure out how exactly, what exactly goes on inside the body. And I think that will be the future of organ on the dish. With this, I uh, would like to take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Dutta, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer question box located on the far left of your screen. And we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, are the organoids developed in the cleavers labs available to other researchers on request? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we have a foundation called Hooperate Organoid Technology, where we have a large collection of these living biobanks, and we have biobanks for cancer uh, organoids from colon, prostate, lung, pancreas, and uh, breast cancer, as well as from cystic fibrosis patients. And all these organoids are characterized by genome sequencing, expression profiling, and also the sensitivity of uh, known drugs have been uh, established and these databases linking the genetic and transcriptional information to the drug, res drug response is known. So yes, absolutely. So if uh, somebody uh, wishes to use these organoids, they need to write to the Hubert organoid technology and uh, the further uh, processing will be done from there onwards. Now, our next question is, is a two-part question. Do you feed the bacteria, and what are their, uh, what are their carbon sources? Uh, feed the bacteria when uh, we inject them, and that's what I understand. So, uh, so the way these bacteria are grown, uh, so it depends. So the uh, anaerobic bacteria or the pathogenic bacteria, so the, these are basically grown on the plates, uh, like the LB plates or the... Um, blood agar plates in the case of anaerobic bacteria, that's how we grow them. And just before injecting, we uh, put them into capillaries. And that's and we put them in capillaries and resuspend them in the media itself or the broth that they were grown in. And yes, yeah, so all the components which are actually used for uh, growing the bacteria in general are also uh, included in the uh, liquid that we inject. And definitely that's why we do feed the bacteria somewhat when we inject them. Uh, once they go inside the bacteria, I think they uh, take up sources from the media components and also uh, from yeah, what, whatever we have added to the media of, for growing the organoids. Now, are there studies showing that normal tissue-derived organoids can undergo neoplastic transformation in vitro? 
Uh, so we have uh, been able to show that, uh, so when we isolate the tissue and grow them as normal uh, healthy organoids, and we keep them in culture for at least uh, 26, 27 passages, and then we again um, check them for SNP and, uh, by SNP analysis and whole genome sequencing, and we have never, um, there might be small aberrations, but there's no a very significant uh, uh, development of any mutation or any kind of aberration in the organoids. So, I mean, I think uh, I don't, uh, I'm not sure of any study which has completely and only focused on this, but our results, from our results in the lab, we consistently see no such uh, thing happening. In the context of tumor 3D cell culture, how are organoids different from spheroids? Uh, so this is um, uh, so technically spheroids are also uh, somewhat 3D in nature. Uh, I think the way they are grown is already different because in the 3D organoids we grow them in a matri gel drop and we provide them in different factors. Spheroids also are 3D, and the only difference I think the major difference is also about uh, uh, about the fact that the spheroids are isolated and they cannot be isolated from healthy human tissue, whereas organoids can be. And that already puts organoids a bit uh, at a higher pedestal because I think for any kind of drug testing, you really need to have a healthy and a, a tumorous tissue, whereas from uh, at least till now, uh, till date, I don't think they have been able to grow the normal spheroids, normal healthy tissue uh, spheroids. Now, Dr. Dada, our next question. Have you tried culturing organoid, uh, excuse me, organoid in scaffolds instead of matrigel, and do you have any preference? Yeah, absolutely. So there was a paper from our lab and also from Matthias Lutol's lab from EPFL where we uh, tested uh, designer matrices, as we call them, and these are essentially polyethylene glycol, um, and these uh, were shown to really uh, help the growth of the organoids, and it was also shown that different elasticity of the matrices matters in terms of uh, stem cell proliferation and also for the differentiation. Um, and uh, yeah, so these are being developed. So these are called uh, polyethylene glycol hydrogels, and these, we are definitely looking forward to these because right now the, the extracellular matrix that is used is uh, matrigel or uh, basement membrane extract, and these are isolated from uh, the sarcoma of mice, and so they are actually isolated from mice, and it's um, not very defined, of course, because uh, it you know, varies from batch to batch, and if we can have these designer matrices or synthetic hydrogels, as we call them, then it will be really uh, way more defined, and we'll know what exactly are the growth factors uh, important. So yes, we are developing that uh, along with the Lutos lab right now, yes. Most of the organoids are made on match drill. However, mm -hmm. in the case of pancreatic cancer, there are lots of collagen around the tumor cells. Do you really think that matrix gel alone can reflect the real physiological situation? In our mm -hmm. hands, when the tumor cells grow in collagen or matrix gel, they have very different morphology. Okay, um, so I am not an uh, expert in pancreatic cancer, but I can say for sure that uh, the people who are doing this research in our lab definitely use matrigel or basement membrane extract, and uh, we have never used collagen, uh, so I will not be able to say how different they are morphologically that, in that sense, but we definitely compare it to the tissue of the pancreatic tissue from which the organoids were derived, and they definitely look like the tissue of origin. So um, I think it's important to compare these two, and um, I am, uh, we are right now developing monolayers where I think monolayers we use collagen, but then of course monolayers look very different from 3D organoids in general. So because collagen uh, is, in our lab at least, used for making monolayers and not 3D organoids. But uh, yeah, what I can say about pancreatic cancer is uh, they, the organoids look very similar to the cancer of origin. Yeah. We are getting so many good questions today, so just as a reminder for our audience, any questions that we do not have time for today will be answered um, via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. So let's continue with our next question. How many bacteria are you using together? Uh, so that's the thing. So uh, ideally, 
uh, what we plan to do is, uh, so we started with injecting one bacterial species at a time because the idea was to really see uh, what each individual bacteria, commensal bacteria, and how it does to the epithelium and how the epithelium and the bacteria interact. And so now um, we have been able to show that uh, single, single bacterial species definitely grow. And now we are trying to include uh, multiple combinations. And we are looking at the literature to see which kind of commensals kind of help each other or potentiate each other. And we are trying to do it in uh, different combinations now. Um, and I think eventually when I talk about the triple co-culture system, uh, it would have to include probably the whole microbiome, whatever, I mean, if not whole, the, most of the species of the microbiome which, is, which are isolated from the patient uh, fecal matter. Yes, so this is where we are right now. But yeah, I think uh, it, it's a long way to go, definitely. We will have to compare lots of different uh, combinations to come to a conclusion. Now, in your organoid immune co-culture, uh, co do you have mm -hmm. to activate the immune cells and stimulate them? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. So, uh, so what we do is uh, you, you have to, so the paper which I mentioned in my talk, so they, what they do is they activate the immune cells so that they uh, kind of become responsive by using antigens, and then they are placed in co-culture with the tumor cells. And uh, various studies have been in, uh, been done to check if it is uh, causing some kind of uh, unnatural activation of T cells, but it doesn't because still the T cells definitely attack only the tumor cells and not the normal um, normal uh, organoids. So yes, we do uh, artificially have to, or we have to activate the T cells to get the population of T cells which actually are tumor responsive. Dr. So Dada, our next question. Do all organoids have an apical, or excuse me, an apical interior and a basal exterior? Um, so all organoids definitely have polarity, very specific polarity. But uh, so uh, right now I have spoken more about the small intestinal organoids, which are more hollow in nature, where the apical side is towards the interior, as I mentioned, and the basolateral side is on the exterior. But uh, some organoids definitely grow as solid uh, ball-like structures, or we call them the compact organoids. And for them, the uh, polarity might be different. But definitely, the polarity is there. It's just that it's not always on the interior or the exterior. I'm wondering about the apical-basal polarity of the ep epithelial cells in organoids, since mm -hmm. the nutrients are uh, since the nutrients available in culture are on the outside of the organoid. Wouldn't nutrient mm -hmm. transporters be localized basally, thus suggesting that organoids are not exactly polarized as in vivo? Um, so, uh, since nutrients are available, so I think uh, the organoids, the way they grow, the nutrients are actually available, they can actually go through because it's not really a very solid uh, structure, right? So there is some kind of passage of the nutrients or the, uh, of the media into the interior also. So they do pass through a bit. And so I, um, I don't think anybody has checked that. It's a very good question. I don't think anybody has really checked if uh, it's completely exactly like how it is in vivo. But I do feel uh, that, I mean, at least functionally, we do see a very distinct polarity of epical and basolateral side. Yeah. Now our next question. For cold culture system, does the ratio of immune cells and organoid matter? Um, I think yes, because uh, definitely an overcrowding of immune cells, we have to always maintain any kind of co-culture, you have to maintain uh, a balance between the cell type and because the media also has to be supplemented for both the immune cells and for the uh, organoid per se. So yes, definitely it should not be overcrowded because you also should be able to really see the movement of the immune cells towards the uh, organoid. And so yes, I think the number does matter or the ratio does matter. In triple cold culture, did, uh, did you try or envisage other cells than immune cells, nerve cells for example? Uh, no, so we haven't done yet. No, uh, unfortunately, uh, we haven't tried that, but it will be very interesting to do that. Right now, what we have done right now is uh, isolating the PBMCs from the blood fraction. 
and uh, we culture those. Uh, we isolate the T cells from them and also we come culture all the PBMs together and then we put them along with the organoids to grow. Uh, but yes, uh, it will be very interesting to put other cell types also, definitely. Dr. Dada, how long can microbes grow in organoids and is it possible to culture them long term? So this is again a question of uh, what kind of microbe uh, we are talking about. So because for some pathogenic microbes, uh, for example, we have tried Shigella, uh, we also um, studied Cryptosporidium. So these microbes are really pathogenic. And uh, so once you inject them, you uh, for Shigella, in, in the case of Shigella, for example, the, uh, the organoid architecture is completely disrupted in three days or even less, actually. Whereas for comestible microbes, uh, these can be grown for at least uh, seven days easily. And then what we do is we passage these organoids and we have seen that these microbes can actually persist. So these have been grown for at least uh, three to four weeks in our, in our lab, yes. Are the media components for healthy and tumor organoids the same? Um, mm, no. Uh, the essential components are the same. For example, we do have to add some growth factors for the cells to survive, but definitely because in the case of, again, uh, the most common uh, type that we study, colorectal cancer, most of the colorectal cancer organoids are uh, mutants for APC, and there is uh, a wind activation, so we can leave out wind from our condition media, and they are really happily growing without these external factors. But of course, the basic, I think the basic factors are very similar, but you can remove uh, uh, factors. And so there is a difference in the healthy. And uh, you can, of course, grow them in the same media as healthy organoids, the cancer organoids, but uh, you don't really need to. Uh, you, you can remove some components, yes. Now, when are large animal model or human, human clinical trials expected? Uh, very, very soon, actually. So I think uh, uh, for the human clinical trial, we are uh, for the cystic fibrosis, uh, not the cancer, but for cystic fibrosis, we have already uh, tested drugs and we have been able to uh, make organoids from the patient and prescribe them the medicine which was actually most efficient for them. Uh, this has been already uh, done, uh, but for cancer, I would say we are looking at uh, four to five years, and it should be definitely be in uh, in clinical trials by then. Now, our next our next question is a two part question: mm -hmm. How is drug testing performed on 3D organoids, and are the number of cells in each organoid the same? If not, then how does one account for the difference in number uh, slash organoids? Yeah, that's uh, one interesting thing that we observe in organoids all the time, that even if we inject, uh, in, even if we see the same number of organoids, uh, or uh, sorry, cells, when, uh, when we are forming the organoids in, at the first day, uh, they grow differently and the organoid size varies um, uh, from drop to drop. So for drug testing, what we do is before we actually uh, perform the test, we shear them or kind of make them as single cells and then we place them in the 384 well plate or, or uh, 96 well plate, whichever is being used, and we let them grow for two to three days so that they become mini organoids, and that is when we uh, do the drug testing. And of course, when we plate them uh, before uh, the drug testing, we make sure that the same number of cells have been plated. So this is how right now we are performing all our experiments, and we use a machine called Multidrop, which uh, uh, makes sure that the same number is distributed. How do you manage bacteria growth? Shigella is a fast-growing bacteria after micro-injection. Uh, and do you add some extracellular antibiotics, such as gentamicin? Uh, actually, no. We, we grow them uh, without any antibiotic because uh, these bacteria, of course, uh, would not like antibiotic in the media. So we, have, uh, we always have a control, and when we inject, we have uh, the injected bacteria, and we grow them without any pen strep. So the, ideally, the organoid media has uh, penicillin, streptomycin, and primosin, but when we are growing uh, these organoids in, uh, with bacteria, we leave out every kind of uh, antibiotic from, from the media. Now, do you keep the cytokines in the media for organoid immune co-culture? Um, do we keep the cytokines in the media? We do. Uh, we do. Um, they are the same. And the media, uh, because I think some of the cytokines are very essential for the growth. 
And so we do keep the organoid culture media same, and then we supplement some which would help the growth of the immune cells. Now, Dr. Dutta, our next question. Do you have any idea of the number of cells inside an organoid, like maybe even a rough number? Uh, that's, uh, I think it's very variable, to be honest, because uh, so far, uh, if we see the small intestinal organoids, there are some which are really small, which would be a few thousand, or uh, yeah, I would say one to two thousand very small organoids, whereas the bigger ones would have uh, 10 to 15,000 organoids, uh, cells in one organoid. So it, it's really very variable, because if you see pictures of organoids, how when we publish, it's really tough to mention or say that. And then these are for small intestinal organoids, even between uh, within the uh, same kind of organoid, but within individuals. Between different individuals, we see different sizes, and the way they grow uh, are very different. So we cannot really say specify a number, really. Now, when will organoid genetically modified intestinal stem cells transplantation or clinical trials be expected? Um, I think this is being tried already because um, we have been able to use CRISPR-Cas9 to, uh, so for, uh, again, cystic fibrosis, we could show that uh, the mod mutation could be reversed uh, using CRISPR-Cas9, and also for uh, human cancers, the research is ongoing. Uh, I think it will, again, be a few more years to go to actually reach a place where we can do clinical trials, but it's in the future, I would say, again, three to four years to go. How long are organoids differentiated in differentiation media? Uh, this, again, is quite variable. So the one thing I think uh, which always stands out is that there is a lot of variability from organoid to organoid. So for example, um, uh, when we in culture small intestinal organoids, we grow them, we make them as uh, in organoids in EM or expansion media for seven days, and then we add differentiation media, which is without the wind and like nicotinamide, for example, and we let them grow for seven days. So for small intestine, we differentiate them for seven days, and we see that most of the cells then differentiate towards an enterocyte or enteroendocrine phase. For liver organoids, for example, it's very different. Liver organoids, uh, there are two different kinds that we have. One is the duct of ductal origin or the cholangiocyte-like, and now we have really uh, recently developed uh, hepatocyte-like organoids. And these actually uh, take way longer, which range from, I would say, 10 days to sometimes uh, almost four weeks. Now, how many organoids per tumor should you grow to represent the whole mutation spectrum of a tumor? Uh, this is a good question because I think uh, this was really studied recently in a lab, uh, in a paper, where we could show that within the same uh, tumor, there was a lot of heterogeneity. So ideally, we should grow as many organoids, or uh, when we get the tissue, I would say we should mince it into as many pieces as possible and grow them into as many different lines as possible And uh, before we, if we really want to do drug testing because it is really heterogeneous within the same not even within the same patient, but just really within the same tissue, a lot of heterogeneity was observed. So, um, yeah, I would say as many as possible from the same tissue resection. Now, is microinjection of organoids better than infecting monolayers? How does one account for MOI? Uh, yeah, so uh, we developed this microinjection for organoids because we wanted to really keep the 3D uh, structure of the organoid intact and because we think the 3D structure really uh, helps us mimic the in vivo architecture. And so uh, I wouldn't say this is better because uh, definitely better when you can actually do it. For some organisms, uh, you cannot really inject. Um, uh, them, uh, or it's not possible, So, uh, or if you really have to maintain the MOI very uh, strictly, then I would go for monolayers, but um, uh, in the micro-injection procedure, we cannot control for the MOI, but we control for the amount of uh, microbes that we inject into each organoid, so that each organoid has the same amount of microbe at the end. And it looks like we have time for one more question. How will the triple cold culture model help in immunotherapy? 
Um, yeah, so this is, uh, this is I think, a dream uh, that we have to use the organoid cultures to really study how uh, the, these three things uh, come together, the microbes and the immune cells and the epithelial organoids, because uh, two recent studies uh, have shown that even in humans, uh, the responders, uh, the responders to immunotherapy uh, drugs, uh, had a different microbiome uh, as compared to the non-responders. And so there is a definite clue in there that uh, the microbiome does play a role in immunotherapy uh, drug response. And so the idea would be if we can have the organoids from a single uh, of a patient and then we can have the microbiome isolated from the patient and, of course, like the immune cells from the same person, we basically mimic the person in a plate, if I can say so. And we will be able to test drugs and really recommend what kind of drug would work for that person specifically, because not ne it's not necessary that uh, drug A, as I mentioned again in my presentation, would work for everybody. So it's very variable. So ideally, that is how I think it will be helpful to uh, tackle cancer in, in general, and especially it will also help immunotherapy to develop immunotherapy drugs. Thank you, Dr. Dada. Do you have any final comments for our audience? I would like to thank everybody for such great questions and for uh, coming and listening to the webinar. And I had a great time, and I hope I was able to make them a bit more aware about what organoids can do and excite them about organoids and the future. Thank you again, Dr. Dutta, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labert and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand through April of 2019. Labyrinth will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.